Um, well, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first next generation leader, Evan McCosco. Uh, Evan received his MD and PhD with Corey Bargman at Rockefeller and at the Cornell Medical College, and is currently doing a postdoctoral fellowship with Steve McCarroll at Harvard Medical School that he began pursuing uh, while doing his residency in psychiatry, and I understand now is an, an instructor in psychiatry at Mass Gen as well. Um, Evan already has uh, quite a number of accolades to his name. He's an NIMH Outstanding Resident Award. Uh, he's received the Schizophrenia Research Award from the American Psychiatric Foundation and is the first recipient of the Stanley MGH Fellowship in Psychiatric Neuroscience and Genetics. Um, Evan's work is really sort of at the forefront of a transformative area in biology that's aiming to understand how the code of the transcriptome, where all, this, all the genes being used, uh, can be used to understand the complete set of cells in complex tissues, to understand the sets of genes that give rise to the properties of those cells, and how dysregulation of these genes could lead to disease. A big challenge for this type of approach is that brain tissues are highly complex, be it 42 types or 4,000 types. There are an unknown number of types of unknown flavors uh, in many cases, and to understand this sort of complexity, you need to understand things at the level of single cell resolution. You need to be measuring single cells, and you need to measure a lot of them to be able to, to process these sort of populations. Uh, Evan's work has involved a technique called DropSeq, which is a really very highly scalable technique that combines droplet uh, microfluidics with sort of massive molecular barcoding to allow you to profile the complete transcriptomes of many thousands of cells simultaneously. He published a really remarkable paper just this last year um, looking at the mouse retina with about 40,000 cells. And I understand this is now up to something like 300,000 cells across various brain regions. So this is really an area that I think is transforming neuroscience at last here uh, to bring transcriptomics to the level of cell types. Uh, and I very much look forward to your talk, Mammalian Gene Expression at Single Cell Resolution. Welcome. Thanks very much, Ed, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and to tell you about our work and to hear about all the work that's been going on here. I've been excited to hear what I've heard so far and uh, look forward to the other talks today and tomorrow. So um, I'm going to tell you about uh, this technology we've developed that allows us to look in very, very high throughput at uh, gene expression patterns in individual cells from complex tissues. So 800 years ago, we thought we had the whole human body figured out. It was a big bag of four different fluids. And when those fluids got out of balance, you got sick. Fast forward to the modern day, and psychiatry has largely replaced the four humors with various neurotransmitters. And um, this is unfortunate in spite of uh, decades of really transformative neuroscience understanding. Uh, we still have not been able to sort of move beyond this kind of uh, amorphous, in, in psychiatry, this amorphous understanding of how the brain functions. And uh, there are obviously a lot of reasons for this. Um, but one that really caught our attention, uh, one particular area of complexity of the brain that caught our attention, is exactly as Ed said, that there's a sort of unknown uh, number of uh, cell populations that compose the brain. And this is problematic not only from the perspective of understanding the physiology of the brain, but it's also been challenging for those of us at the Stanley Center who have um, been identifying a, vari a variety of different uh, uh, gen genetic association loci to psychiatric illness. How can we start to formulate uh, meaningful hypotheses that can then be tested for what these uh, gene loci are actually doing to cause dysfunction in the brain? And so we got interested in trying to sort of build a technology that would allow us to routinely uh, form those kinds of hypotheses using uh, uh, gene expression analysis. And the reason we chose gene expression analysis is because despite the fact that um, uh, there's such a great deal of heterogeneity in the brain in terms of the functions of particular cells and the morphology and the physiology of these cells, they all utilize gene expression program programs to some extent to carry out those functions. So it seemed reasonable to use that information as a first pass to understand this complexity. And we, I say here that you know a thousand cell types are estimated. Of course, that number, depending on how and, and who you uh, talk to, can range from hundreds to thousands. And so um, uh, we wanted a system that would allow us to really do this. And we, uh, when we started this process uh, of thinking about a technology three years ago, the main way in which one would do RNA-seq analysis was to grind up a piece of tissue into a smoothie and basically sample those uh, ground up hundreds or thousands of uh, or millions of cells 
uh, and just sort of get an average gene expression profile for that piece of tissue. But we know that for the vast majority of contexts, uh, gene expression operates at the level of cells, not at the level of tissues. And so when we were thinking about how we could do this in a routine way, we thought we want to instead turn the brain more into a fruit salad in which the RNA uh, transcripts have a cell of origin associated with each one of them that we measure. So um, we also realized that uh, as we were talking to members of our community uh, that you know, this sort of uh, high throughput single cell gene expression profiling was something that was going to be useful to a large range of biologists, not just in neuroscience, but across biology. And so we came up with sort of a wish list that we imagined people would want for various experiments. And the first thing we realized that was important was extreme scale, the ability to uh, measure tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of individual neurons, or sorry, excuse me, cells in a particular experiment. And this was important, especially for neuroscience, because we know, um, many of us here, uh, that there's a great deal of complexity uh, in uh, nervous system tissue, far more than in other uh, tissues of the body. We wanted something that was flexible in its scale because sometimes it's useful to sequence deeply uh, and sometimes it's also useful to sequence broadly. Um, and we wanted something that would profile cells from a, a tissue that, in an unbiased fashion. Um, the cells of the brain especially vary dramatically in their morphologies and their shapes and so forth. So we wanted something that would not uh, uh, be uh, beholden to a particular uh, size range or shape. Um, that was important to us. And finally, we wanted something that was simple, fast, and easy to do. And this reflected the fact that we saw that many people in many areas of biology wanted this sort of technology to be available to them in a standard molecular biology format. So today I'll tell you about our development of this technology, which we have named DropSeq. And uh, our first testing of the technology uh, in a uh, uh, system, the mouse retina. And then finally, I'll tell you about what we've been learning from DropSeq since the publication of our paper earlier this year. So uh, the main challenge, there are methods, of course, you've heard about some of them already, uh, to generate single cell RNA-seq libraries. But the central challenge to using them is the time and cost that's required to prepare these libraries. You have to isolate single cells using uh, large pieces of equipment, like a fax machine or by, by hand, as many people continue to, to do to some extent. Um, and uh, you then have to prepare, do a series of molecular biology reactions that are expensive and time consuming. And so we got interested in using a technology called droplet microfluidics to scale down these reactions to the picoliter to nanoliter size range so that you could do millions of these reactions in the volumes that you would traditionally uh, do uh, you know, a, a few hundred or thousand. Um, and so we imagined, you know, could we put a cell in these, in these individual droplets and uh, uh, process the RNA that came out of those cells in, high, in high, uh, highly parallel experiments? And there are other members of our community who were also interested in this, in particular Oni Basu, who uh, was a postdoctoral fellow with uh, David Weitz, as well as with Aviv Regev. And we sat down to try to think about how we might get this to work. And the main thing we realized was that the challenge here is that droplets don't come with addresses. So the moment that you make a droplet, it's very challenging to add or subtract uh, fluid from it. It's not impossible, but very challenging. But even more challenging is to track all of those individual droplets as, um, after they've been formed, because it's basically just a huge swirling emulsion. It's very hard to track them all. And this is in contrast to the way one would do a, mass, a parallel experiment in a, um, in a, a microtiter plate format. So what we imagined doing was delivering a payload of um, oligo-DT primers on a, on a surface of a bead as a way of um, uh, uh, specifically uh, capturing the RNAs from a specific um, cell. So imagine the uh, bead accompanied by a lysis agent. And when the bead is in solution with a cell, in the droplet with a cell, the RNA is released by the lysis agent. And then it hybridized by, by hybridizes by its um, poly-A tail to the uh, oligo-DT region of the primer. But this reaction, this hybridization reaction, is happening across thousands, if not millions, of individual droplets. So we needed a way of making the, uh, uh, the identity of these primers uh, on the surface of the bead uh, distinct from the identity of the primers on every other uh, bead. So we chose to do this by a modified form of oligonucleotide synthesis. The same beads that we use in DropSeq, we use as a solid support for oligochemical synthesis. We take the beads and we split them out into four equal reaction chambers and we add an A, G, C, or T. After we pull them back together, this first round of synthesis, we have four uh, individual barcode species. If we do this a second time, we end up with 16 species. But if we repeat this process 12 times, we have more than 16 million unique uh, barcode sequences in a pool of beads. We tested to see how many individual primers were on the surface of the bead. And we found that there were more than 100 million on average on each bead. So there's a high payload for each individual droplet. 
And furthermore, if you look at the complexity of a pool of these barcodes, you find that it approaches theoretical limits, suggesting that we should be able to easily distinguish amongst tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of individual uh, barcoded beads. So armed with this uh, reagent, we turn back to conceiving of an overall system in which we could use them in droplet microfluidics. And we came up with this system we call DropSeq, in which we dissociate a complex tissue. And we um, uh, incorporate this, these dissociated cells along with beads into droplets. The cells lyse, the RNA is released, and hybridized to the bead. That's the only reaction we do in droplets. We then break the emulsion, collect all the beads together, and do a single in-bulk reverse transcription reaction. That forms what we call stamps, single cell transcriptomes attached to microparticles. And then we can pool any desired number of these stamps to do highly multiplex single cell RNA-seq. So this is one of the devices uh, that Oni uh, designed uh, and fabricated. It's very similar to the one we use uh, today. So cells are coming in from the uh, top and bottom. Uh, and beads are coming in from the right, uh, suspended in a lysis agent. They're moving so quickly that diffusion doesn't have time to occur until after uh, the uh, flows pass by an oil channel and uh, the fluids get uh, pinched off into equally sized nanoliter droplets. We can make 8 million of these droplets in an hour. So if we load cells and beads at very, very low occupancies, we can ensure we get single cell resolution and also are able to generate some order of thousands or tens of thousands of individual cell libraries in an hour of processing. So this is all well and good, but we wanted a system that we really knew worked. And so what we chose to do was to take a mixture of cultured human mouse cells, because the transcriptomes of human and mice, humans and mice, are sufficiently divergent that any 60 or almost any 60 base pair uh, read should be uniquely aligned, can uniquely be aligned to only the human or the mouse genome. And this allowed us to get very, very detailed measurements of the specificity of our system. How much uh, contamination is there across individual cells? So uh, if we do drop seek with this uh, mixture of human and mouse cells, um, and we uh, sequence individual cell barcodes, if we recover uh, cell barcodes that have a mixture of human and mouse transcripts, we've basically recapitulated standard RNA-seq, uh, where we're just um, sequencing an average of the different species of uh, cell species in the solution. But on the other hand, if individual cell barcodes are organism-specific, the only explanation for that is that we've recovered the uh, library of a single cell. So uh, this is the first experiment that generated meaningful data. Uh, each individual blue dot is a cell barcode, and we're counting the number of unique human and mouse transcripts we have um, in each one of those uh, barcodes. And you can see that most of the dots here are in the center, but a few are on the edges, which would never be expected by chance, which was encouraging to us. And we continue to improve the technology, particularly aspects of the way in which we load cells and beads in our system, as well as the uh, lysis agent that we use to release the RNA from cells until we finally sequenced 160 cells, and we found the vast majority of those individual cells to be organism-specific. We then did another round of tech dev, the tech dev on this system, and particularly optimized the hybridization so we could capture more of the uh, transcriptome. So this is the same data on different set of, set of axes. And now today, with these particular cell lines, we're able to routinely capture tens of thousands of unique transcripts from each individual cell without sacrificing much in the way of um, uh, cell, cell specificity. So uh, in its current form, uh, DropSeq is capable of producing about 10,000 single cell libraries for sequencing in 12 hours. And the cost to make these libraries is on the order of six cents per cell. And both of these represent about 100-fold improvements over existing approaches to doing single cell RNA-seq. We've made our protocol open source and available online. Uh, this is very important to us because we think that this is something that will be useful to many people uh, in the community. And indeed, already uh, we're excited in the last several months uh, since the release of our paper that uh, many labs have started to adopt this technology in uh, fields ranging from neuroscience to immunology to cancer genetics. So I wanted to take you now through the first data set that we acquired from a complex tissue, and that was the mouse retina. And this was work that was done uh, in collaboration with Aviv Regev and Josh Sainz's labs. So we started with the mammalian retina for several reasons. First of all, it's a really amazing piece of tissue. It's responsible for processing most of the light signals that an animal receives from the environment. And it does so with a uh, circuitry that is uh, on the order of complexity of the rest of the CNS. There are many different uh, uh, types of cells. They have interesting and, and varied morphologies. Um, and, but perhaps the most important reason for us starting here is that decades of really, really high quality research have given us detailed understanding of the markers of specific cell classes as well as cell subtypes for, all of, uh, for many of these individu 
individual cell population. So the uh, profiles that we generated, and we generated about 45,000 profiles uh, from uh, a P14 uh, day um, uh, mouse retinas, we could use that information, cluster it, and see how well those individual clusters mapped onto existing knowledge markers of individual cell populations that have been uh, assiduously validated by a variety of different means. So our data starts with uh, a set of paired end uh, reads from an Illumina uh, platform. One end uh, is a cDNA end, and it gets aligned to the mouse genome. And the other end has our barcoding information, the cell barcode, as well as a unique molecular identifier, which allows us to count individual transcripts. So using a, uh, a now well-established pipeline, uh, computational pipeline that um, we have available online, we are able to de generate what's called a digital gene expression matrix with n columns for the number of cells that we sequence and m genes for the number of genes we detect. And we have an integer count of each number of genes that we detect in that cell. We perform principal components analysis on that data. And this is a uh, movie of an algorithm called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, which is a way of reducing the dimensionality of these PCs down to uh, two dimensions that you can visualize on uh, paper or on a, uh, image, a projection image. Uh, this was uh, an algorithm was adapted for single cell analysis by Rahul Satija. So each individual cell is weighted according to its PC loadings in this algorithm. And so cells are attracted to each other based on uh, common PC loadings. And at the end of this algorithm, we ended up with a plot shown on the left, where we had a total of 39 distinct populations with, that were transcriptionally distinct. Um, and uh, what we could now do is take all those populations, compare their gene expression, and made a, make a you know, sort of gene expression dendrogram that would allow us to look at um, uh, how those particular uh, populations are organized and with respect to what's known about the retina. So that's what's shown here. And what we were really assured to find is that for the markers of particular cell classes, we found that those cell classes grouped together. So the three populations of interneurons, the horizontal cells, all of the individual populations of amacrine cells, and the populations of bipolar cells all clustered together, as well as the photoreceptors and the output cells, the retinal ganglion cells. We then also identified um, a variety of glial populations, and these are indeed all the populations that have been documented as being uh, resident in the retina. So again, this is the power of the retina, that we have all of these markers that allow us to really uh, identify immediately the cell class of each one of these 39 uh, populations. We were particularly intrigued by the diversity that we saw in the amacrine population, 21 populations. This was many more than had been identified previously um, by uh, gene expression analysis or physiological analysis. Um, and uh, uh, we were encouraged to see that we found uh, the populations that have known markers, such as the cholinergic starburst amacrine neurons and the excitatory uh, population of amacrines. Um, and we also saw a great deal of diversity amongst the GABAergic amacrines that had not been previously documented before. The really nice thing about this data is that you can then find individual markers of all these populations. So that's what we did here, um, looking for genes that are highly enriched for one specific one of these amacrine populations. And this is data that can now be used by Josh Sainz's lab and other labs to um, genetically access these particular populations and figure out what's morphologically or functionally distinct about them. The other really uh, nice thing about the retina is that we um, have a uh, sort of benchmark of the relative representations of cell populations based on microscopy that had done, been done in Dick Mazin's lab as well as other labs. And we were able to compare our own data with that existing data. And what we were encouraged to find is that there was no um, gross overrepresentation or underrepresentation of specific cell populations, suggesting that we're relatively um, uh, unbiasedly sampling our tissue. Finally, uh, since, uh, the, uh, since our uh, uh, accumulation of this data, we've now been able to validate um, over 40 markers by in situ hybridization or immunohistochemistry, suggesting that the inferences that we're making from our data are well supported by other methods of measuring gene expression. So that's uh, sort of where we were um, with uh, this particular technology. And we're really excited um, by what we were able to do with it. And we wanted to see uh, what we could do next, or what are some of the things we wanted to do next. And so here are some things that we're actively thinking, thinking about and working on. The first thing, and these are some vignettes that I'll tell you about today, relates to um, uh, extending these kinds of analyses that we did in the retina to other tissues in the CNS. Secondly, um, we've been really excited to use this technology because of its ease and, and, and routineness as a way of uh, benchmarking various differentiation protocols for in vitro derived tissues and cells. 
Third, we think this is a tool that will really allow us to get a, a better sense of how much um, uh, allelic imbalance contributes to differences in gene expression. And this is something we're actively working on. And finally, um, we also are interested in seeing how we can use this uh, particular uh, tool to compare across particular strains of mice and also per per across particular species. So I'll be telling you again about a few quick vignettes related to this first sort of effort. So the first goes back to the retina, because um, in our initial data, what we, one thing that we were surprised by was that we only had one particular cluster of retinal ganglion cells. And the retina actually is known to have a great deal of molecular and cellular diversity amongst RGCs, and so we wondered why that was absent. But despite the fact that we sequenced 45,000 cells, we only had 432 retinal ganglion cells. And so um, our, our question was maybe we didn't have enough to really uh, uh, routinely and, or be able to really appreciate all of these patterns, especially in the context of all of these other cell populations. And so we uh, performed an immunoenrichment uh, uh, procedure uh, with the help of Allison Bialis to sequence a total of 4,000 retinal ganglion cells. And we were encouraged to find that um, uh, by, by clustering those particular cells, we were able to recover 23 populations. And this is on the level of what's been estimated amongst particular populations. This is exciting not only from the perspective of retinal biology, but we're really encouraged by this because this is something that we think is going to be useful to us as we move to other tissues where the same problem occurs. In the retina, uh, you know, 80% of the cells are photoreceptor cells. Um, and so uh, many, other, uh, many other tissues in the brain have the same problem, where a very rare cell population contributes a lot to diversity. Secondly, another interesting thing that we got excited about was um, whether um, dropsy could be used as a way of understanding the cell populations that respond to a particular uh, signaling molecule for which there's a known ligand. I mean, sorry, for which there's a known receptor. And one example of this is the uh, hormone leptin, which of course contributes to a variety of different um, aspects of uh, animal physiology, uh, animal uh, m uh, energy balance, as well as um, aspects of feeding behavior. And we know that leptin acts particularly through the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. That's where the most concentrated um, uh, expression of leptin receptors um, is. Um, and we know that uh, the POMC neurons and the AGRP neurons of the arcuate nu nucleus do contribute to this response, but there are also additional populations that have not been identified yet that we know are important for that response. And so we worked with John Campbell and Linus Sai in Brad Lowell's lab to sequence uh, arcuate nucleus cells and see whether we could identify additional leptin receptor positive populations. And um, this is a uh, clustering uh, plot of uh, about 8,900 arcuate neurons. And you can see that uh, if we look at leptin receptor expression, we find expression amongst AGRP positive neurons and POMC neurons. But we also see expression in a novel population that has unique markers. And so we're excited now that um, uh, John and Linus have been uh, using those unique markers to genetically access these cells and find information about how they're uh, function, they integrate into the arcuate circuitry. Finally, in our own lab, um, we've been very excited to extend the sort of analyses that we've done in the retina to other tissues to gain more insight into the overall complexity of the uh, mouse brain and particularly adult uh, mouse cell populations. And this was made par and possible in no small part to the arrival in our lab of R.P. Saunders, who joined as a new postdoc recently and pioneered methods of generating very, very high quality single cell suspensions from adult mouse tissues. And so far, uh, with the help of Melissa Goldman, a technician in a lab who has heroically put through all of these individual uh, cell libraries to sequencing, we've sequenced a variety of different uh, brain regions. And we're now starting to uh, process and, and analyze this data to understand what are the overall um, diversity of individual populations within tissues and also across tissues, because we're excited about maybe finding whether there are particular populations of neurons that are uh, shared across particular brain regions, whereas ones that are specific to certain brain regions. Um, so we're very excited to continue with that work going forward in the future. Um, ultimately, though, um, our, our main interest uh, is to uh, move beyond these cell type classifications and uh, characterizations of diversity and use our experience with characterizing these data sets to understand pathological states. Um, and this is something that is going to require additional degrees of um, technology development um, in order to really uh, 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 you know, have the tools that we need to really use DropSeq in these contexts, but it's something that we're really actively working on. And we're also interested, as I've said at the beginning, to connect genetic results that have been identified in, uh, as associated with uh, particular mental illnesses with biology. Can we see particular enrichments of certain um, of these uh, genetic results in particular subtypes of the brain, um, both in the mouse brain and also in, in the human brain? So those are some of the things that we're uh, excited to do going forward in the future. 
So with that, I just wanted to thank some people who have been really essential to the success of this work. I've mentioned many of their contributions already, Oni and Arpi and Melissa. I also wanted to recognize in our lab Laura uh, Bortolin and Jim Nemish, who built a lot of the uh, uh, computational pipelines that we use routinely to analyze this data, as well as um, my uh, advisor, mentor, uh, Steve McCarroll, who has really believed in this project and worked hard to make this project possible for several years now. So thanks very much. I think we have plenty of time for questions. Hello. So uh, I have a question about the, how about the uh, subcellular uh, part. Uh, let's say in the synapse there are some uh, mRNA, and when you dissociate the cell, it's still intact or intact or is it missed or? Inevitably, when you dissociate cells, uh, you find uh, either retraction or a sloughing off of uh, processes. So yes, you will probably lose a fair amount of the RNA that's present uh, in, the, uh, in the processes. Of course, that RNA has been produced in the, in the soma, so there will be some of it that you know, is being transported as the um, you know, cell is alive, it's turning over. Um, but it's certainly the case that um, uh, the, any sort of dissociation technique is going to lose some degree of the, of the trafficked uh, 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 you know, uh, RNA. Okay, thank you. Um, I understand that the great advantage of the drop seek, of course, is that you can process so many cells uh, very efficiently, uh, but we also understand that the uh, sequencing depth per cell is very low. Um, it's a great approach to have many, many cells to do classification, but how much can you learn about each cell's identity and the physiology of each cell? I think this would be particularly relevant if you want to study the changes in disease and things like that. Um, and if you can learn uh, the limited amount of information from each cell, after you do classification and when you pull cells together, have you looked at it, would that give you uh, richer information? Uh, sorry, well, I'll let me answer the first part. Um, so um, uh, the choice to sequence at a low depth was a, was a choice on our part. Um, so we, we choose to, to do you know, uh, 10,000 individual profiles for uh, primary cells on a single NextSeq run. And the reason is, is that um, uh, in any of these amplification approaches, the amplification introduces a huge amount of asymmetry in how individual transcripts are amplified. So when you uh, sequence, uh, even at very low depths, you will see that certain uh, transcripts are being sampled 10 times, whereas you're only just starting to see one transcript. So you have this problem at every level of sequencing depth. Our approach and th thought process, at least especially in this early stage where we're starting to just understand overall diversity, is that it's more advantageous to get more transcripts. I mean, at cert one certain step, there's more uh, at a certain level, it's more advantageous to get more transcripts from more cells than to get a uh, more transcripts from a single cell, but you know fewer overall numbers of transcripts compared to what you could get by going broadly. So I think the example of the um, arcuate nucleus is a good example of where I think that uh, the strategy is paid off. Leptin receptor is notoriously very lowly expressed. And you can see in the data, I guess I can put it back, but you can see in the data that um, a very large number of these neurons actually don't have any leptin receptor expression, right? However, like especially in the AGRP positive and the POMC positive neurons, I'm actually not sure, you know, I'm not an expert, I don't know overall what the overall pr documented percentage is in, you know, IHC or uh, AISH studies. But you can see that that particular, um, that regardless of that, that, that you can still see very strong enrichment of that particular transcript in those particular populations. And so even for things that are lowly expressed, we're able to see those things relatively um, uh, easily because we see so many individual cells, if that makes sense. What do you see as the, as the major limitations to this technology? We've heard a lot of the advantages. What do you see as some of the, the technical hurdles for uh, DropSeq moving forward? Um, well, I think uh, the, the, many of the technical hurdles are the same ones that uh, have been uh, challenging for a variety of different uh, approaches to single cell analysis. I think the overall sampling issue is something that we obviously want to improve. So. Um, uh, we sample about 10% of the RNA in an individual cell. I think if we can get that number up to 30 or to 40 or 50%, I think that would be really, really great. Um, I think there are some molecular uh, methods and techniques that we're trying to see if we can make that possible. Um, and uh, relatedly, you know, because of this challenge of uh, 
unbiased amplification. Another thing that we're really interested in is trying to try, f try find different approaches to amplification that can sort of improve this, this issue of bias. Hi, that was great, thank you. One quick question, especially with respect to the leptin receptor work. Have you made um, any attempt yet to correlate what you see an, on transcript expression with proteomic expression, like even doing flow analysis of those subpopulations to see if there's a disconnect with respect to, to um, you know, regulation of the receptor at the transcriptional as opposed to the translational level, and that might explain for some of your uh, variation? Yeah, um, we, we have not done that work. Um, I think it would be very interesting. Um, and actually now there are some techniques that allow one to do very, very high throughput analysis, single cell analysis of um, many different uh, proteins, you know, for example, Cytoff. And I think pairing this kind of data with Cytoff is a great way of doing that because the challenge of Cytoff is that you only get 40 markers, but you never know which markers to choose, right? Because if you don't have an overall map and understanding, like which ones do you actually choose? Um, and so this would be a great way of combining these technologies. I think that's a great idea. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thanks.